Good evening. I'm Bob Horvath. I'm the chairman of the board of the Norman Rockwell Museum, and I'm very lucky to be chairman of the board of the Norman Rockwell Museum. This is a wonderful place. I'm so happy you're all here on this gorgeous Berkshire evening. Did you see that moon out there tonight? It's beautiful. I think the fantastic, this fantastic exhibit is another key piece in the field of American illustration art that the Norman Rockwell Museum continues to collect, preserve and make available. We are growing and expanding and it is the interest in illustration, as is the interest in illustration art. It's a tremendous field that is just blowing up. I would like to note that this show that we're having tonight, Hannah Barbera, the Architects of Saturday Morning, is the first comprehensive exhibition of this award-winning studio which remained a popular force in the field in family entertainment from the 1950s to 2000. The exhibition will remain in view through the end of May of 2017. And we hope that you come back again and bring your grandkids and your children and all your neighbors. This is wonderful and I love it and I hope you do too. I feel privileged and extremely happy to be part of the Norman Rockwell family and this institution. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Laurie Norton Moffat, our CEO and director. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Bob, and for all you do and your dedication to American illustration art and this museum. How are you all feeling tonight? Yes. You know, I was kind of thinking Saturday, Saturday morning, maybe I'd just stay in my pajamas and bring my blankie and a pillow and get ready for the cartoons tonight. And then I had visions of that on the front page of the Berkshire Eagle and decided, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> so welcome to Saturday night at the cartoons uh, at Norman Rockwell Museum. It's really wonderful to have so many friends with us to celebrate the opening of our new exhibition, Hanna-Barbera, The Architects of Saturday Morning. How many of you remember the years before the rise of cable television, when Saturday mornings were a treasured time for children in America who looked forward to waking up and watching cartoons on only three major television channels? Is this going to out you? Yes. All right. Uh, you know, only a certain age group of us can cohort can acknowledge that. From 1958 through the 1980s, a majority of those cartoons bore the Hanna Barbera imprint. The animation powerhouse created such memorable hit shows as Tom and Jerry, The Flintstones, Johnny Quest, Scooby Doo, Super Friends, The Smurfs, and as you will see, many, many others that have become part of our collective memories and important contributions to American visual culture. Included within this comprehensive exhibition is an exciting array of original animation art, sketches, model sheets, archival materials, commercial products, and an interactive installation that draws from the vast library of sound effects created by Hanna-Barbera. Thousands of drawings and paintings and hundreds of artists were required to bring joy into the homes of so many. And it is these artworks and creators that Norman Rockwell Museum seeks to preserve, interpret, and present. The art of illustration is at the core of this museum's mission, and we proudly hold the largest and most significant collection of art and archival materials relating to the life and work of legendary American illustrator Norman Rockwell and a growing collection of original illustration art that reflects the vibrancy, evolution, and resilience of the field from the emergence of printed mass media in the mid-19th century to the innovations of digital media today. We think of illustration art as the art of the people, at once the most democratic, influential, though sometimes strangely anonymous and invisible form of art. And it's through our dedication to this expansive body of materials, which have reflected and shaped American popular culture, that we seek to examine the nature of published images and their integral presence as artistic and cultural artifacts in our world. And we, try to, we strive to honor the many gifted artists who, unlike Norman Rockwell, who was very well known and famous by his name, worked diligently behind the scenes for magazines, for newspapers, 
book publishers, animation houses, and advertising agencies, often anonymously, to entertain, educate, and inspire us without the benefit of personal fame and recognition that Rockwell achieved so early in his lifetime. So we're just thrilled tonight to bring these joyous artworks and the many working artists who made so many memories possible and Hanna-Barbera, the architects of Saturday morning. And as you go through the exhibition, I hope you'll really think about what it took for an artist to draw all these characters, create them in their imagination, and repeat them over and over and over again to create an animated form uh, that had, was a moving image, but that started with the drawn image. I'd very much like to thank our sponsor and lenders to this exhibition, which features more than 250 original works of art. And mind you, we don't own any Hanna-Barbera cartoons, so we borrowed all of these, made possible by the generous lenders to this exhibition. I'd like to acknowledge um, the sponsors and the, le the lenders, if you'll indulge me. We're so grateful to the Cater Group, the LLC in Lenox, Massachusetts, who has made um, this exhibition possible, and we appreciate the support and enthusiasm that they have provided. And um, we know that this art form is a collecting passion of Frederick, so um, we're really, really happy to have your support of this tonight. Now, you may not have known that you knew so many uh, cartoon collectors, but we'd very much like to thank, and if you didn't mind waving your hand or standing when I call your name, because you made this exhibition possible, Paul, and, and forgive me if I mispronounce any names, Paul Bussolini, Richard and Linda Bernstein, Tony D. Ter Terlizzi, Dr. Michael Dragutsky, Craig England, Mike Fazio, I'm not seeing any hands, David Franklin, Mark Hilbert, Frederick Cater, Craig McCracken, Dave Nimitz, Dave Prixma, I apologize that, Fred Siebert, Janine Van Eaton, and the Warner Brothers Archive. Appreciation also goes to Jane Barbera, Jerry Beck, and Michael Mallory for their outstanding catalog essays. Um, it's a beautiful catalog. Uh, to all of our lenders, we hope that you will pick your copy up, and this is available in the museum store. It's just a wonderful treasury of uh, these original cartoons and information about them. I'd like also to extend congratulations to curator of the exhibition, Jesse Kowalski, on his outstanding work on this exciting exhibit, and thank the entire museum staff for their accomplishments. There were a lot of works to hang, and you might notice we painted the colors of the galleries of rather vibrant green and blue to bring good cheer and bring these cartoons to life. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Frederick Cater of the Cater Group, who is a collector and appreciator of the art of animation himself. Please welcome Frederick. <laughs> Thank you, Lori, and thank you, Bob. Uh, this is just a great, great institution. It's a great family institution, and really that's what we as the Caters have always been about, is about family. Uh, I'm one of eight children. My mother's the youngest of 10. My wife's mother's the youngest of 10. Um, I've stopped at three. Um, <laughs> my son made it all the way up from school in Connecticut to be here tonight. My youngest son is apparently, according to our last text here in Stockbridge, is on the penalty kick line at Westfield State, taking, have, having taken a overtime penalty shot in their uh, Western Mass game, so he can't be here. My daughter is in Connecticut at her last soccer game, um, and she can't be here, but I'm blessed to have my brother and partner, and my mother, who's the founding member of our organization, uh, Sheila. I'm so very happy that 14 years ago, Stephanie Plunkett told me no. I brought to her an idea of an animation show to weave together generations of families, great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, through the art of Warner Brothers. Uh, 14 years later, we're blessed to have Jesse Kowalski with us at the Norman Rockwell, who came to me and called and said, I had this idea about doing a show on Hanna-Barbera. I said, I'm in, tell me what you need. You've got my unwavering support. Little did I know that I was the tip of the iceberg. Jesse's 
encyclopedic knowledge and passion for this uh, medium is amazing. And uh, really, I, I thank you deeply for putting this together, and I think this is going to be a fabulous, fabulous exposition. Jesse Glossop. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Fred. Uh, thank you to everybody here for coming to the first major exhibition on the work of Hanna-Barbera. Uh, putting together an exhibition of this size and scope is much more work than one person can handle. So I would like to thank those who helped make this exhibit possible. Uh, I was just overjoyed at the enthusiasm of everyone I, I came in touch with about uh, the Hanna-Barbera exhibition and just the, the glimmer of light in their eyes uh, about, about the studio. Uh, first of all, Fred Seibert in the back, uh, the last president of Hanna-Barbera in the 1990s. He was my first contact to the people involved with the world of Hanna-Barbera. I actually note his involvement on the company, with the company on a text panel in the exhibit. I refer to him as a young creative genius. 20 years later, two out of three ain't bad, huh? <laughs> uh, Jerry Beck, way in the back, uh, the world's foremost scholar on the history of animation for generously offering his time and advice over the last 18 months. Uh, Frederick Cater for not only being the first lender to the exhibit, but also being a key sponsor for the exhibition. Uh, David Nimitz uh, for for loaning his uh, wonderful collection of toys for the exhibition and sharing his knowledge of Hanna-Barbera memorabilia with me. Tony Benedict in the front row, one of Hanna-Barbera's first writers for being one of the men who's inspired me throughout my life, especially during the last year. Artist uh, Tony Dietrolizzi, Tony? He's, uh, he loaned us some key works for the catalog and uh, shared his enthusiasm for illustration with me with the exhibition. I'm actually working with Tony on a major exhibit of his works that will debut here next November. Um, I'd like to thank Laurie Norton Moffat again, director of Norman Rockwell Museum, for going out on a limb to allow this new curator who came from the other side of the tracks, uh, the Andy Warhol Museum, <laughs> a chance uh, to explore a different side of illustration. Um, from the exhibition staff who had to put up with me throughout the last year and a half, Martin Mahoney, uh, for being in control of every aspect of the exhibit and turning my dreams into reality through his gentle, soothing personality. <laughs> he paid me to say that last part. Uh, Thomas Mosquita for his help with installation and documenting the works as they came in. Uh, Joe Tanetti, who had a very difficult job of framing 255 original artworks. Barbara Runback for helping keep track of the artwork. Um, being good natured, she was always eager to help and has a great ability to make me smile when things are hectic. From the digital staff, Rich Bradway, who spent many, many hours incorporating sound effects, video clips, design, and images into the great interactive uh, in the back galleries there. It's a beautiful addition to the exhibition. And Dan Heck, who assisted with the design and web aspects for the exhibition. Uh, Pat O'Donnell, our newest member of staff, who assisted in designing the interactive and kept me laughing during the uh, exhibition when I needed it most. Um, outside of the museum, Bill Killen, who put together that great interview documentary of uh, my interviews with Tony, uh, Jerry Eisenberg, Willie Ito, and Bob Singer. Uh, Julia Morneau, who was here over the summer as an intern who spent a lot of time refining my myriad facts and figures about Hanna-Barbera into something recognizable, and uh, Wade Bircher for his fabrication of the great uh, interactive database. I also want to thank my wife Heather and my children John and Catherine uh, for indulging me in my love of illustration and animation and for watching so many different Hanna-Barbera cartoons that my son John finally got fed up with me and asked if we could just stop watching cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> And my mother is here uh, for teaching me that what is important in life is to be happy and for letting me enjoy Saturday morning cartoons. I suppose you could say I've been researching this exhibit for about 40 years. And finally, Stephanie Plunkett. Stephanie? There she is. Uh, Chief Curator and Deputy Director of Norman Rockwell Museum, who has inspired me for the past six years. From our first meeting in 2010 when I was researching Norman Rockwell for an Alex Ross exhibit, um, I should add that every time I speak with Alex, he asks about Stephanie or, and reminds me he's never worked with a nicer person. Stephanie's graciousness and talent are beyond compare. 
and to all the staff of the Norman Rockwell Museum since everybody had a hand in putting this together. Um, so when I talk about this exhibition, the first question I'm usually asked is why are you doing a Hanna-Barbera exhibition? Uh, as Joseph Barbera's daughter Jane told me, Hanna and Barbera's mission was to make people laugh, for people to enjoy themselves. Uh, in a time with so much uncertainty and fear in the world and demand for our attention, I wanted to make an exhibition that would make people smile and remember a time when all you had to worry about was what hour the Flintstones was coming on. Uh, recently, I discussed the exhibition with a reporter who referenced other exhibitions going on dealing with police brutality and political strife and how I could justify doing a show about Saturday morning cartoons. I admitted that there are those harsh realities in the world. And we deal with them every day uh, in life, in newspaper, on the internet. And people need an outlet to get away from that, you know, just for a little bit and to laugh and feel good about themselves. Just as Norman Rockwell painted pictures during the Great Depression of children, feeding, uh, children swimming, a Boy Scout feeding puppies, or a young woman trying on her prom dress, we need gentle reminders that there are things in life worth enjoying, like watching a cartoon cat chase a mouse, seeing a bear trying to steal picnic baskets, <laughs> or sitting down to view a show about a group of teenage detectives with a talking Great Dane as they explore a haunted house in which Don Knotts pays a surprise visit. Uh, so why at the Norman Rockwell Museum? Um, well, Hannah and Barbera met in, at MGM in 1938 and created their first Tom and Jerry short in 1940. Uh, that was, first short was nominated for an Oscar, as was their third short. In 1943, there were, they won their first to Oscar for Tom and Jerry. The next year, they won another Oscar. The next year, they won another Oscar. And the next year, they won another Oscar. <laughs> By the end of their time at MGM in 1957, they had won seven Oscars for their work and were nominated for eight additional Oscars. After animated shorts ceased production in the mid-1950s, there were essentially only Disney and Hanna-Barbera left as the major animation studios. Near the all, nearly all of the other studios had closed or had sold off their backlog of cartoons. MGM, Paramount, Warner Brothers, Terry Toons, and Universal, while others were hanging by a thread like UPA and Jay Ward. Disney had ceased creating animated shorts, but continued with animated feature films, while Hanna-Barbera began designing animated cartoons for television. Part of the reason for Hanna-Barbera's early success was their rich pool of talent. Once animated shorts stopped production, Hanna-Barbera snatched up the best and the brightest. Men who had worked at Fleischer Studios, at Van Buren, at Terry Toons, at Disney, UPA, Warner Brothers, and MGM. Men like Tony Benedict, Michael Maltese, Warren Foster, Dan Gordon, Art Scott, Ken Muse, Alex Lobey, and Carlo Vinci. In Jerry Beck's book, The 50 Greatest Cartoons, Michael Maltese wrote four of the top five greatest cartoons of all time. It was these men who were responsible for creating Hanna-Barbera's most memorable cartoons, like Huckleberry Hound, The Yogi Bear Show, The Flintstones, The Jetsons, Quick Draw McGraw, and many, many more. Hannah and Barbera found a market for children's programming, first in syndication and then on Saturday morning. In 1965, they produced their first cartoons directly for Saturday morning, The Secret Squirrel Show and The Adam Ant Show. When they first aired, Hannah Barbera's cartoons Space Ghost and The Herculoids were watched by two-thirds of all households. And they also found a market for adult programming when they discovered that half of Huckleberry Hound's audience were grown-ups. So they devised the first primetime cartoon series with the Flintstones, which was the longest running animated primetime series until The Simpsons. The Top Cat, The Jetsons, and Johnny Quest also debuted in primetime. When pressure from outside groups forced their superhero programs off the air, they turned back to comedy with Wacky Races, The Banana Splits, and A Dog Named Scooby-Doo. To this day, Scooby-Doo has two comic books published every month, has a new cartoon running on television, a new animated movie was just released on DVD, and Warner Brothers is planning a big budget live action version of Scooby and the Gang. While other studios rose and fell along the way, Hanna-Barbera adapted. If networks needed more content, Hanna-Barbera hired all of the animators they could in the US and then looked abroad for more help in Taiwan, Mexico, Australia, and other countries. Hanna and Barbera were able to shift gears quickly. If a lower budget studio found success with something like the Archies, Hanna-Barbera would have a bigger success with Josie and the Pussycats. If they felt superheroes were needed, they created the Super Friends. 
When NBC wanted to stop running Saturday morning cartoons in 1980, they brought the Smurfs to the network. Though the quality diminished as the older, experienced talent left and more content was in demand, Hanna-Barbera maintained their dominance in the field with nearly 70% of all Saturday morning cartoons produced by them. In the 1980s, the end of Saturday morning cartoons was on the horizon. College football was expanding into Saturday mornings. Infomercials were legalized, and there was no cost to the network to show those. Cable TV could run more exciting, action-oriented content, while broadcast networks were banned from doing so. And corporations began creating their own cartoon channels. Ted Turner bought Hanna-Barbera in 1991 with the intent of launching his own cartoon network with most of the content supplied by Hanna-Barbera. In 1992, Cartoon Network began broadcasting and young creative genius Fred Seibert was hired to revitalize Hanna-Barbera with shows like Johnny Bravo, Dexter's Laboratory, and the Powerpuff Girls. By 1995, Hanna-Barbera no longer had any cartoons on Saturday morning television. In 1998, they were absorbed by Warner Brothers, where the property still resides. Hanna-Barbera continued to go on to work every day until the end of their lives. The 50-year tradition of Saturday morning cartoons ended on October 4, 2014, when the CW network became the last network to air Saturday morning cartoons. But their legacy of Hanna-Barbera continues. And their spirit lives on, as I can clearly see in each of your eyes and as I walk through the galleries, with the smiles on your faces. So what was it about Hanna-Barbera that made us all of us fall in love with their cartoons? As William Hanna noted, the characters were likable, they were funny, and you could tell that they really cared about each other. Now what's wrong with that? Thank you. Now, I'd like to introduce a very special man. Tony Benedict began working at Disney Studios as an in-betweener on Sleeping Beauty in 1956. And then he worked briefly for UPA as an assistant animator and storyboard artist before joining Hanna-Barbera in 1960. He was on equal footing with legends of animation like Michael Maltese and Warren Foster, who were 40 years older than him at Hanna-Barbera. Benedict was an animator, a writer, and a storyboard artist for such cartoons as The Huckleberry Hound Show, The Yogi Bear Show, The Flintstones, The Jetsons, Top Cat, Secret Squirrel, on and on. In 1962, Tony Benedict penned the episode of The Jetsons in which their dog Astro is introduced. After leaving Hanna-Barbera in 1967, he produced his own cartoon, Santa and the Three Bears, which will be on view here in December as part of our film series. And he continued to animate well into the 1990s. Uh, Benedict lately has been uh, producing a documentary of his life in animation. Um, as a child, I paid attention to the, special, to, to the names of the credits in the cartoons as I was watching them. It's one of my quirks. I remember seeing names like Jane Barbera, Jerry Eisenberg, Iwo Takamoto, and Tony Benedict. I'm so thrilled to introduce one of my lifelong heroes to the stage tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tony Benedict. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jesse. <laughs> uh, I think Jesse has done a terrific job putting this show together. It's the best Hannah Barbera exhibit I've ever seen. <laughs> he took it from a, an idea and made it happen. He came out to Hollywood sat down with uh, Jerry Beck, sat down with me and Willie Ito and Jerry Eisenberg. Uh, where Jerry and Iwo and I all worked together at Hanna-Barbera during those uh, glory days. So uh, I'm uh, not a historian, but uh, what I recall may be more of what I've seen than what actually happened. So I'll give you a little taste here of my little trip to Hanna-Barbera. The first uh, time I met Joe Barbera, he was introduced by Alan Dine and myself. 
And Alan says, Tony, I want you to meet Joe Barbera. I've known him for 20 years, and now you know him as well as I do. <laughs> <laughs> so the first animated film I ever saw was a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Uh, a cat chasing a mouse with a meat cleaver. Uh, a very simple plot line. <laughs> but it, it got lots, lots of laughs. I never laughed harder. And before television, the only way to see an animated cartoon was to go to a movie theater and uh, see it on the big screen. So uh, there also was a accompanying every feature film, there was a short six minute cartoon that preceded the feature movie attraction. The wide popularity of cartoon characters like Tom and Jerry was a big draw. In fact, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences awards an Oscar to the best animated short film each year. Bill and George cartoons won seven Oscars. But the studio, studio exec, exec Fred Quimby took the bows and walked off with the Oscar. It, they never went to Bill and Show. It was the best of times for us, and then as the, it became the worst of times. The major movie studios determined that these cartoons had become too costly and added zero points to their box office receipts. MGM, Warner Brothers, Paramount, and Dizzy shut down their short animation units. Disney, of course, kept on with the feature films. But for most people in the cartoon business, it was gloom and doom. Until, like in an old movie western, the cavalry charged into the rescue in the form of Bill, Hannah, and Joe Barbera. The two former MGM producers put together a production team made up of mostly former MGM employees, and they plotted to build a less costly system of animation for the emerging new market of television. It became known as limited animation, but it wasn't very limited. It was cheap, fast, clever, and funny. Mostly cheap. <laughs> That's what sold it. Fewer drawings to be inked, fewer cells to be painted, and sent to camera. And put on Bill Hanna's super efficient, no frills production line. Character designs were also somewhat limited. Yogi Bear only had a few colors and very little detail. Characters like Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam and even uh, Tom and Jerry were a bit complicated. The fur had to be drawn. So, uh, also, a, uh, another example, take from an eight-drawing Yogi Bear walk socket and remove four of the, these drawings in between each other. And the animation still worked, just not as smooth, but with excellent writing and voice acting and some snappy dialogue, nobody cared. <laughs> it was a approximately a 50% cut 
in time and labor to make these. Uh, veteran writers like Warren Spotser and Michael Maltese were well trained in animation and they knew how to draw. Warren and Mike came from Warner Brothers where they wrote Oscar winning uh, cartoons, Pepe Le, Le Pew, uh, Bugs Bunny, and all the stars of it, Warner's. So when the uh, business slowed down, or should say collapsed, they, Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera were just starting up, and Joe Barbera brought in Mike and Warren. So they were well trained, as I said, but they did not write scripts. If they wrote visually on blank storyboards, a direct link to animators who didn't have to interpret poses, attitudes, and expressions from a typed script. In 1963, Bill and Joe opened their new Jetson style sparkling cartoon studio. It was the very best of times. Their partnership had already lasted 30 years, but still, Bill and Joe were quite unlike each other. Bill was a button down Irish man from New Mexico while Joe was a suntanned Italian from Brooklyn, New York. Bill drove a white Lincoln. Joe drove a shiny black Cadillac. Bill ran a tight ship. Joe sold his shows. Bill read the Wall Street Journal, and Joe preferred Hollywood Reporter. Bill resided down in the valley and Joe up in the hills of Bel Air. The tale of the cock in Studio City was Bill's favorite restaurant, a quiet, family-friendly restaurant. Joe's favorite restaurant was Musso and Frank's on Hollywood Boulevard. Joe wound up marrying these hostess there. <laughs> But when it came to making cartoons, they were in perfect sync. Joe was the creative force. He might say the uh, creative genius. Joe had uh, his initials on his collar, on his uh, coat, and he was, uh, he had a very, uh, good impression of himself. <laughs> he cast the top voice talent, writers, characters, and background designers available. He hired all the best, actually. He directed voice recording and supervised new show development. Bill picked up from there with his A-plus production team of directors, editors, music, inking, and painting, audio, dubbing, all the way to delivering to ABC Network. Bill always uh, came in on time and below budget, far below budget. <laughs> But he would go to ABC and say, we can't do this show at these prices. Can you give us more money? <laughs> and he got it. <laughs> so uh, in 1960, Bill and Joe struck gold with the Flintstones, the first animated cartoon series in prime time on network television. Next, Cadme Jetson, and then Talk App. All of this was well before Saturday morning cartoons. Warren, Mike, and I, Mike Maltese, Warren Potzer, and I were the only staff writers uh, at this time. There were a few uh, freelance 
right, it's the Charlie Shows who contributed, contributed a great deal. It's, but however, a shortage of cartoon writers became quite a problem because the studio was cranking out so much footage. So Jai, Joe hired live action comedy writers to fill in. And it was part of my job to insert visual gags into these scripts, which were well written but didn't have any visual humor in. So the Flintstones lasted for six years on the network. The good times never felt so good. I thought it was going to last forever. But that jury wide ended when Bill and Joe sold the studio to Taft Bracket Casting in 1967. The studio continued to prosper beyond Bill and Joe's wildest dreams, but it was a different place. Bill and Joe later realized he had sold out a bit too early because the studio took off into the stratosphere. So uh, that's pretty much my story, and uh, I'm stuck with it. And if, <laughs> if there's anything I said that is not true, then it should be. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tony. It's incredible to have your first-hand knowledge, and we are so honored to have you here. Thank you again. Congratulations again, Jesse. What an extraordinary exhibition. I just want to mention we're so fortunate it'll be on view through May of 2017. We have many wonderful programs coming up in association with the exhibition, uh, including tomorrow at 1 p.m. So if you'd like a little bit more Hanna-Barbera, we actually have a great program uh, called, called Toys Galore, The World of Collecting with Dave Nimitz, who has some terrific toy collections in the exhibition. Uh, we're also going to be starting a great Saturday morning cartoon series, very appropriately, uh, starting on Saturday, November 19th. And, going uh, every month, and we'll have cereal and very unhealthy breakfast foods and <laughs> have a great time. And in addition, Jesse is actually going to be doing a great series of talks called Cartoon Connections, and he has uh, such immense knowledge, as you've already observed. So uh, please check our website at nrm.org uh, to learn more about programs coming up. And in addition, we thank you so much for your support. If you're not already a member, we hope you will join us uh, to support uh, our exhibitions and programs and uh, the art of illustration. Thank you again for coming, and we are so happy to see you tonight. Bye-bye. <laughs>